Yep, thank you. Good morning, everyone. To our NCAS Journal Club this morning. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, um, wherever you are and listening in, and when you are later listening into this presentation as we record it and put it onto our website. So it is with very great pleasure that I would like to introduce Julianne Cousmont, who is actually a French ID physician who is um, working with us at uh, Peter Mac. And um, he, has, uh, he, ha he has come from um, Brussels, from the University Libre de Bruxelles. And his PhD was actually around focusing on urinary tract infections in kidney transplant recipients. Um, and really looking at the issue around screening and treating asymptomatic bacteria after kidney transplantation. Asymptomatic bacteria, of course, is a vexed issue with antimicrobial stewardship. So this, the findings from this study are really very important and um, it would be interesting to see how the, how the same issues transfer to other populations. So Julianne, over to you. And um, we look forward to listening to the findings of your um, multi-centre. Uh, thank you, Kath, for your invitation. I'm very uh, happy to be with you today to talk about uh, some works I've done previously in Belgium, as you said. I'm going to share my screen now. Does it work? Oh, good. So, <clears throat> Um, I will be talking, in fact, about uh, urinary tract infection uh, after uh, kidney transplantation and especially about the management of asymptomatic uh, bacteria uh, in kidney transplant recipients. My interest for this question started when I was uh, training in, in, in Brussels, in Belgium, seeing all my transplant colleagues uh, routinely ordering urine cultures at each post-transplant follow-up visit and using quite a lot of, of antibiotics to treat these episodes of, of asymptomatic bacteria in kidney transplant recipients. And uh, it's important to understand that this practice of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria after kidney transplantation is an old habit in many kidney transplant centers, which is based on two theoretical concerns. First, um, the fact that kidney transplant recipients are at high risk for urinary tract infections, especially uh, for acute pyelonephritis, because of many factors, including immune suppression and anatomical abnormalities of the urinary tract. And second, there is concern uh, that post-transplant pyelonephritis, so the, the, the invasive infection of the kidney may present without symptoms of urinary tract infection in this uh, specific population due, due to uh, both graft denervation, uh, which is um, systematically done at time of transplantation, of course, and um, immune suppression, of course. And it is true that uh, pure nephritis can sometimes present, present with uh, very few or even no symptoms of urinary tract infections in these uh, patients, in, in kidney transplant recipients. And to illustrate that, I've selected this um, interesting case report, which uh, comes from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, um, and which was about a patient who presented 10 years after his transplantation uh, with an episode of acute kidney injury. This patient who had absolutely no symptoms of urinary tract infection, no symptoms of UTI, had a kidney biopsy done to investigate this episode of graft dysfunction. And Two hours post um, uh, elective biopsy, he developed a septic shock. And interestingly, all the investigations done uh, at the hospital, including the urine culture and the kidney biopsy that were done when the patient was still fully asymptomatic, showed that this patient was, in fact, having a fully asymptomatic graft pyelonephritis. And uh, such cases probably, uh, well, I think that such cases probably fed the belief that asymptomatic bacteria should be, uh, is a concern and should be proactively screened for and treated uh, in this population of kidney transplant recipients. So for those of you who are involved in the care of, of kidney transplant recipients, I don't know what your uh, practice is. Um, I've got the feeling that uh, 
uh, screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteriuria is also uh, very common in Australia, but uh, I'd like to show you how common is the practice of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteriuria in our um, transplant centers in Europe. I will now show you the results of a European survey of practice um, that uh, we did two or three years ago, supported by the um, SQUID and the ERA DTA, which is the uh, European Society of Nephrology. So in short, we sent an invitation to participate to more than 600 physicians uh, actively involved in the care of uh, kidney transplant recipients in Europe. And we obtained um, answers from 244 uh, physicians representing 138 hospitals in Europe in uh, 25 countries. Uh, so that was a response rate uh, of 30 percent, which is, I think, not too bad for this type of large uh, survey of practice. And as expected, the, the vast majority of respondents were um, nephrologists, as you can see, and uh, 80 percent of them had at least five years of clinical experience uh, with um, kidney transplant recipients. It was a, a short, very short uh, online questionnaire including 17 questions, which were mainly about the diagnosis and the management of asymptomatic bacteriuria after kidney transplantation, of, of course. Um, so we started with a, with a very, you know, very simple question. In stable, asymptomatic, adult kidney transplant recipients attending the outpatient clinic for follow-up, do you screen for bacteriuria? And as you can see, the vast majority of the survey uh, participants. Julian, your slides are not, are not progressing. Are you on a different slide from the one that has asymptomatic pyelonephritis? Oh, yes. Uh, can't you see my, that's a bit weird. Uh, can't you see my diagram now? No. Um, so it is moving on my side, Cass. Okay. That's not um, moving on this side. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I'll try to go back. Just go back and, yeah, try. Sure. What do you see now, Cass? We're only on the asymptomatic pyelonephritis question. Oh. Now we can see the X, the, yes, that's it. We're on okay. the page now. Sorry, so this is probably a slide that you missed, which was uh, about the, um, the survey of current practice that I was presenting before. And I now move to the uh, good slide. Can you see it with the, with the diagram? All good, working now. All good. So we started with this very simple question. Do you, do you screen for asymptomatic bacteriuria in asymptomatic kidney transplant recipients attending uh, the outpatient clinic? And as you can see, the vast majority of the uh, survey participants reported either always screening, so in other words, uh, with repeated urine tests from the kidney transplant until either patient either death or graft loss, or screening only in the, the first, as you can see, two, six, 12 months after the kidney transplantation. So probably quite a lot of screening with urine tests um, in these asymptomatic patients. I'm now moving forward. Can you see my new slide? Yes. Uh, so we then use the hypothetical case of an episode of clear post-transplant uh, bacteriuria with more than uh, 100,000 CFU per milliliter of E. coli, as you can see, but no symptoms of UTI. And we ask the study participants, do you treat asymptomatic bacteriuria in this situation? And uh, I found interesting to see that very few uh, transplant physicians answered, I never treat asymptomatic bacteriuria, but that also very few answered, I always treat asymptomatic bacteriuria. Instead, as you can see, the, the, the vast majority of participants said they would treat asymptomatic bacteriuria in uh, selected situations using this, all these criteria that are, I think, of, of debatable uh, value and, and, and validity, such as when the patient is in the first uh, six months after transplantation, 43% of the participants. For instance, when the patient has a double J stent or a bladder catheter, half of the 30 participants. 
when the patient has a recent history of symptomatic QTI, 42% of the survey participants. When there is pyuria, 27% of the survey participants. And or when the serum level of CRP is increased, 43% of the participants. So probably quite a lot of, of you know, um, good reasons to, to start antibiotics, I think. And we did not only look at whether they were treating or not with antibiotics, but also at how they were treating, at which antibiotics they were using for these episodes of asymptomatic bacteriuria in kidney transplant recipients. And we took the case of a very simple episode of asymptomatic bacteriuria with a fully susceptible E. coli and no contraindication to um, uh, antimicrobial agents. And we were surprised to see that quinolones, as you can see, were the preferred agents, despite the very well-known risk of selecting and amplifying resistant um, organisms. And it's in fact uh, important to consider both potential benefits on one side and potential arms of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria on the other side. So on one side, it is true that screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria may uh, possibly improve patient and graft outcomes. That's possible, including uh, um, reducing the risk of developing a symptomatic UTI, especially a graft pyelonephritis, with then possible implications in terms of kidney function, in terms of allograft projection, or even in terms of graft loss. And these are very important outcomes for, um, for the patients. But on the other side, antibiotics use also as harmful effects. Um, and as you all very well know here, I think you know, antibiotics is a key driver for antimicrobial resistance, which is an uh, issue of particular importance in the field of transplantation. And so this is, this is why considering all these elements, we decided to rediscuss our historical practice of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria after kidney transplantation especially in stable patients that we defined as, do, as those who are at least two months post kidney transplantation and do not have a urine catheter. So we looked, you'll see in the next slides, all our work looked at the patients who were at least two months post transplantation and did not have a urinary catheter. So how did we uh, proceed to, um, to, um, to answer our uh, question? So, well, for any screen program to be cost effective, these two criteria must be satisfied. First, uh, the targeted condition, so asymptomatic bacteria in our case, um, should be sufficiently prevalent in the screened population, so kidney transplant recipients, to justify the expense of screening. And second, an intervention should be available that improves patient outcomes when the condition is detected, and that could be antibiotics. So let's start with the first criteria. So to address this question, we uh, performed a cross-sectional study at three transplant centers in Belgium and in France, and we determined the prevalence of asymptomatic bacteria among 500 consecutive kidney transplant recipients attending our outpatient clinics for routine post-transplant care. So included patients were at least, as I said, two months post-transplantation and those currently having a um, urine catheter were systematically excluded from the study. All participants performed a uh, urine culture at time of the uh, follow-up visit and possibly a control culture. The first culture was positive and we uh, use the IDSA uh, criteria to define uh, uh, asymptomatic bacteria. So I won't go into the uh, uh, details, but in short, um, the point prevalence of asymptomatic bacteria was found to be lower than expected in, in kidney transplant recipients, and specifically only around 3% um, of the screened um, kidney transplant recipients. So um, uh, where, where we're found to uh, have asymptomatic bacteria. So 
<clears throat> that was regarding the first criteria. Let's now move to the uh, second one, which was, uh, which is about the effects of uh, using antibiotics if you detect asymptomatic bacteria. So we published in 2018 a Cochrane systematic review on this question uh, with the intention to identify and review available evidence um, from randomized control trials and from quasi-randomized control trials and to clarify the benefits and harms of, of uh, treating asymptomatic bacteria with antibiotics in kidney transplant recipients. But because one randomized controlled trial has been published since the Cochrane systematic review, I will show you in the following slides an unpublished update of this meta-analysis. So we had um, um, in total one quasi, uh, three studies, so one quasi-randomized controlled trial from uh, Iran and two randomized controlled trials, both from Spain from Spain uh, with data available for a total number of 287 um, trial participants. And in these three uh, studies, kidney transplant recipients with asymptomatic bacteria with, were assigned um, in a one-to-one -one ratio to either antibiotics or no therapy for um, asymptomatic bacteria. Inclusion and exclusion criteria, of course, varied between the studies. Uh, but it's important to remember that patients developing asymptomatic bacteria in the first weeks or months after the kidney transplantation were uh, systematically um, excluded from the trial or systematically treated with antibiotics. Again, I don't have um, time to go into the details of these trials, but let me show you the uh, results for um, our primary outcome, which was the incidence of symptomatic UTI. So if you treat or if you don't treat asymptomatic bacteria, what is your chance of subsequently developing a, a symptomatic UTI, which could be a cystitis, which could be pyrifritis, which could be associated with the bloodstream infection, and so forth. So as indicated here, uh, our meta-analysis of these three studies found no significant effect of antibiotics on the incidence of symptomatic UTI with the risk ratio around one and a 95% confidence interval ranging from 0.66 to 1.6. There was also no significant benefit on other uh, relevant um, uh, outcomes in these studies, uh, including on kidney function, graft projection, graft loss, uh, need for hospital admission due to UTI or death. But whether the absence of a significant difference between the groups, between the antibody group and the, the no therapy group, reflected a true absence of clinical benefits associated with antibiotics remained uncertain because all three um, included studies had major limitations. In particular, sample sizes were. Um, uh, small with only 40 to 50 participants assigned to antibiotics in each study. And there was uh, only limited compliance, compliance to the uh, screen and treat strategy um, in both randomized controlled trials uh, with, um, in short, many participants assigned, allocated to antibiotics, but not receiving um, the intervention exactly as planned. And additionally, in both randomized controlled trials, um, the primary endpoint of pyonephritis occurred much less frequently than uh, expected by the investigators. Um, that is in no more than, than five participants per study group. So as a consequence, the certainty of the um, evidence was low for uh, important outcomes such as symptomatic UTI. So we therefore performed a um, randomized uh, control trial called the BIRF study uh, to um, answer our question and to clarify the effects of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria in kidney transplant uh, recipients. So our trial called the BIRF study was a, an open-label uh, multicenter trial in 30 hospitals in France and Belgium. Participants were recruited through usual follow-up clinics using the fact that we 
routinely screened for uh, asymptomatic bacteria at post transplant follow-up visits. We included patients with um, asymptomatic bacteria defined as the isolation of one organism at at least 100,000 CFU per uh, milliliter. And in this trial population, we compared the um, intervention, which was 10 days of antibiotics selected by the um, treating transplant physician uh, with um, the control, which was uh, no therapy. As I said, it was uh, uh, an open label uh, trial. So in other words, a trial that was not blinded. So importantly, um, patients again, as in our previous studies, had to be at least two months post-transplant, and those currently having a urinary catheter were uh, systematically excluded. And as you can see, our primary outcome was the incidence of a symptomatic UTI over the one-year study period. And in both groups, uh, participants were followed for 12 months after their inclusion and randomization with um, seven study visits, as you can see. And importantly, I think our trial may be considered as a strategy trial uh, because it evaluated not only the effects of treating or not treating the baseline episode of asymptomatic bacteria, but it also evaluated the effects of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria during the one-year study period. In fact, a urine culture was systematically performed at each of the seven study visits that you can see here. And if asymptomatic bacteria occurred again at one of these follow-up visits, antibiotics were re-administered in the antibiotic group, but of course not in the uh, control group. So overall, 199 um, kidney transplant recipients with asymptomatic bacteria were included and randomized. As you can see on the right side, more than 70% uh, of them were female patients, which was expected in mean age was uh, 60 years. 27% of the trial participants were in the first year after kidney transplantation at time of inclusion and E. coli um, was the most common organism responsible for uh, bacteria, for asymptomatic bacteria. So we told about the um, um, lack of, or, or we told about the uh, limited compliance uh, to the intervention, the previously published trial. I think um, an advantage of our trial was that the compliance to the uh, protocol was very good, as illustrated by the fact that um, more than 90% of the 1,400 scheduled urine cultures were performed. And the good compliance was also illustrated by the fact that the median number of antibiotic days per patient for asymptomatic bacteria for the one year study period was zero days in the uh, no therapy group versus, as you can see, 20 days in the um, antibody group. And I think from, uh, the, uh, from an AMS perspective, uh, it is remarkable to see that this large difference in terms of uh, antibiotic use remained largely significant when we looked not only at the number of antibiotic days for asymptomatic bacteria, as we did here, but also at the, at the total number of antibiotic days per patient for any cause. So not only for asymptomatic bacteria, but also for any other reason, including uh, symptomatic UTI or respiratory tract infections, for instance. And in fact, um, we um, ended with a, with a large difference with only six days of antibiotics over the one-year study period in the no-therapy group, as compared with uh, 30 days in median um, of antibiotics over the one-year study period in the um, antibody group. So quite a lot of antibiotics um, used. Uh, were the antibiotics effective? Yes. 
from an, um, a microbiological perspective, I think we can say that antibiotics um, are effective, uh, or at least were effective in our trial. This is the first follow-up visit done one month after randomization. Um, and you can see that the prevalence of uh, asymptomatic bacteria in our trial was significantly lower in the uh, antibody group uh, than in the no therapy group. And that difference in terms of um, of, uh, uh, of prevalence of asymptomatic bacteria remained largely significant at one year after um, study inclusion. But this microbiological effect uh, of antibiotics did not translate into um, any significant clinical benefit uh, for the patients, including for the incidence of symptomatic uh, UTI, as you can see here. The blue line represents the uh, antibody group, and the red line uh, represents the uh, control group, so the no therapy group. As you can see, almost 30% uh, of the BERT trial participants uh, developed an episode of symptomatic UTI during their one year follow up period, which is quite a lot. Uh, but there was no significant difference between the two groups with an ASR ratio of 0.8. 83 and a 95 percent confidence interval ranging from uh, 0.5 to 1.4. And antibiotics also had no significant impact on any um, of our secondary clinical outcomes, including the incidence of death, of graft loss, graft rejection, uh, pyronephritis, bloodstream infection, or hospital admission. And there was also no significant difference between the groups in terms of um, kidney function during the, the, the study follow-up. And then point uh, for which there was a, a significant between group difference is the emergence of resistant organisms in the urine. So to assess this um, important outcome, we focused on the 80% of trial participants that had at least one further episode of asymptomatic bacteria during the follow-up, um, during the trial follow-up. Uh, and, and we compare this new episode of bacteria with the baseline episode of asymptomatic bacteria. And compared with the participants' baseline episode of bacteria, this second episode was more frequently caused by a, uh, an organism resistant to clinically relevant antibiotics in the antibiotic group, 18% than in the no therapy group, 4%. And uh, for your information, clinically relevant antibiotics in this study were defined as um, ciprofloxacin, um, cotrimoxazole, and third generation kephalosporins. So let's go back to this slide which was on the um, incidence of uh, symptomatic um, UTI. The last thing that we wanted to study uh, was why do some kidney transplant recipients with asymptomatic bacteria remain bacteriotic and well? And we had quite a lot of kidney transplant recipients in this situation, patients that were doing very well with, with, with the bacteria in their urine. And why, in contrast, why do some patients progress from asymptomatic bacteria to acute pyonephritis? So what determines this clinical outcome? Uh, once the bacteria enters the bladder of a kidney transplant recipient, is a bit uh, unclear. And one hypothesis is that patients uh, that develop pyonephritis have more virulent strains uh, more virulent bacterial strains than do comparable patients that remain asymptomatic and well. An alternate hypothesis is that uh, those patients who progress to pyronephritis have greater host susceptibility. For instance, it could be a higher state of immune suppression. To address this question, we conducted a uh, separate study during which we prospectively collected all E. coli isolates uh, responsible for either post-transplant pyonephritis on the left side or post-transplant asymptomatic bacteria uh, that's on the right side. 
So on one side, we had 53 episodes of um, post-nostrum pyonephritis. Patients were generally uh, febrile, as you can see. They had a, a median CRP level that was pretty high, 280 milligram per uh, liter. And uh, there was an associated bloodstream infection in half of the cases. Most patients also had an acute injury associated with pyonephritis, as you can see in the figure. On the other side, on the right side, with uh, 19 episodes of post-transplant uh, asymptomatic bacteria, and of course, these patients were um, fully asymptomatic and as expected. As you can see, they did not have um, um, acute kidney injury at time of uh, bacteria. Again, as in the uh, previous studies that we discussed, uh, included patients were at least two months post uh, kidney transplantation and had no catheter. In other words, they were um, stable kidney transplant recipients. We then compared these two groups uh, in terms of host factors and then in terms of microbial genetic factors with the intention to identify factors associated with the risk of developing a pure infrasis. So I know the, um, the, the two groups were of um, relatively limited size, but still it was interesting to see that there was absolutely no significant difference uh, between the kidney transplant recipients uh, and those presenting with um, asymptomatic bacteria in terms of host factors, including for um, age, uh, sex, including for uh, transplant parameters, anti-reduction therapy, or including um, the recent history of these patients or, um, uh, or in terms of, of kidney function. So we then uh, looked at the bacterial factors using bacterial whole genome sequencing. We looked at many different things, but I will focus today on the presence or absence of virulence genes, which was assessed by sequence alignment using software called Binumerics. After creation of an in-house database of more than 200 nucleic um, ACID sequences, collectively representing 48 virulence factors for each isolate. So in other words, for each of the study isolates, we assessed um, the presence or absence of 48 um, genetic virulence factors. And here are our results for the virulence content of each um, isolate. So E. coli isolates that were responsible for pyonephritis are in red, and those responsible for post-transplant asymptomatic bacteria are in green. And here um, we show whether the uh, 48 virulence factors that we assessed were present or absent in the study isolate. So the main conclusion of our study is that pyelonephritis isolates differ significantly from asymptomatic bacteria isolates for the prevalence of the PAP operin, which is a genes cluster that encodes the uh, proteins required for, for production of p which is, uh, as you know, one of the best studied uh, E. coli eurovirulent factor. So I think our these the, this result suggests that um, isolates that are able to to cause post-transplant pyelonephritis are particular, and this reinforces our impression that systematically screening for and treating all episodes of asymptomatic bacteria is probably not helpful in this population of patients. So here is my uh, last slide. As a conclusion, there is uh, accumulating evidence that the uh, historical practice of screening for and um, treating asymptomatic bacteria is not beneficial among kidney transplant recipients, and that it probably increases um, overall antibiotic use and that it promotes the emergence of more resistant bacterial organisms in the urine of our kidney transplant recipients. We therefore believe that systematic screening for bacteria more than two months post-kidney transplant uh, should not 
longer form part of routine patient follow-up. Uh, and importantly, uh, we should not extrapolate our conclusions to the first uh, two months post-transplant because such patients were not eligible for our studies and because there is fear that um, uh, there is fear of rapidly progressing um, uh, infections in these patients who have a high degree of immune suppression and of a ureteral uh, catheter, which of course may facilitate the um, ascent of pathogens from the bladder to the kidney graft. And last, um, symptomatic UTIs and especially acute graft pyelonephritis remain prevalent and detrimental of the kidney transplantation. And as discussed in the previous slide, uh, bacterial adherence seems to play a role in its pathogenesis despite significantly altered urinary tract anatomy and weakened immunity. And whether kidney transplant recipients might benefit from targeted therapies such as anti adhesion therapies or vaccination, of course, has yet to be uh, uh, studied. Thank you for your attention and happy to take any question you may have relating to this uh, presentation. Thanks. Um, thanks, Julian. That's, um, it's an incredible body of work. My question now, as an antimicrobial steward and interested in implementation, is what do you think needs to happen next to result in a change in practice and or policy? So, uh, so that's, I think, the big question now. Uh, one issue is that um, we don't always know what people do uh, in real life. So this is why we wanted to do the survey of current practice, but the, uh, you know, the current practice in Australia, for instance, could be different from uh, what it is in Europe. And even in Europe, we probably have large differences and we already have centers that do not screen. So there's nothing to do there. And you've got centers that screen um, for and treat asymptomatic bacteria a lot. So I think what is important at a local level is to first discuss with the transplant colleagues and try to understand what they do. And um, I'm clearly not a specialist of that, but I think what is very important is to ask them why they do these things. Um, try to understand what, what, you know, what, what triggers the, uh, the use of antibiotics. So the second, the second thing um, is that it's probably harder to change things. Uh, and I'd be very interested to know what you think about that. Uh, it's probably harder to change things uh, in this setting, which is an, mainly an outpatient setting. Uh, it's pretty hard to do antimicrobial stewardship at the outpatient clinic as compared with the uh, uh, inpatient setting. And I think the best way to stop using antibiotics is to stop doing urine cultures, of course. Uh, and so maybe to try to modify the ideas um, I think we should look more at, at that diagnostic stewardship than true antimicrobial stewardship. What do you think? Well, I guess the, the following step is how do you translate the randomised controlled trial into clinical guidelines, which is the next step. And then the question is, are those guidelines actually implementable, which is your, your issue here? So how, how do you... Um, uh, create something oh. when, it, when, as you say, it's almost it's very difficult for stewards to monitor what's going on. And so then it needs to come through different groups and it would need to be very strongly endorsed by the, um, and you would need assistance and, and engagement from the renal mm. physicians broadly. Um, sure, yeah. And so that's, that's the challenge. It's like surgical prophylaxis. It's very hard to do without actually getting active engagement from the surgeons themselves because they are a highly specialised group and the belief system's probably going to be quite strong that we, you showed that actually the antibiotics worked in <laughs> treating the <laughs> urine culture but had no major long-term benefit other than generating resistance, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a quite, it's a nuanced approach to dealing with highly specialized physicians. And we find that in hematology, oncology, 
that you have to be very um, targeted in the approach to make them believe that they can change their practice. Yeah, yeah. And what what was also interesting for me is to realize that the uh, the uh, intervention that we were testing um, in all these trials, including ours, which was giving antibiotics to treat asymptomatic bacteria. So the so-called intervention was in fact standard of care in most transplant centers. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, this is, I, I think this was something that was interesting with this trial is that you're doing something not because it's evidence-based, but you're doing something because it has always been done. And when I try to, to dig a bit uh, you know, and to understand why, you know, when they started to, to screen for and treat asymptomatic bacteria, for instance, I started calling the, uh, the old head of the uh, um, uh, transplant unit in Brussels. And this person was in his late 80s, said, oh, but we've been doing that since the 60s. And, you know, it's just something, it's an intervention, an unproven intervention that has always been done. And uh, it's a bit odd that we had to conduct some randomized trials to test this intervention that was already the standard of care uh, in many centers. So yeah, and regarding your point, uh, you, you, to you told about the guidelines. I think it was interesting to see um, that the guidelines were updated before the publication of our trial. And I was a bit surprised to see that the um, IDSA guidelines, which were published in 2019 or early 2020. So just before the publication of our trial um, made a strong recommendation against the practice of screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria based on um, what they called high quality evidence, which was only the two um, uh, trials um, from Spain and Europe that we included in the Cochrane review. And it was interesting to see that we uh, in the Cochrane group ended with a um, uh, with an you know uncertain effect of antibiotics and low quality evidence, while the IDSA panel ended with a strong recommendation and high quality evidence. So, mm. but, uh, yeah, again, the most important thing is probably just to to try to change things, not in the guidelines, but um, uh, in the kidney transplant units and especially at the outpatient clinic. Um, Rob, oh. an excellent talk. Are there any figures or one the risk of pyelonephritis after asymptomatic bacteria? That's the first question. Uh, so the risk of pyelonephritis after asymptomatic bacteria. I can share my screen again. Uh, and I will. Just, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. So that was. So that was. Uh, that's obviously something we looked at in the. Um, clinical trial. So this is the uh, incidence of symptomatic UTI uh, after asymptomatic bacteria. So you can see around 30% uh, in the first uh, year after asymptomatic bacteria. But of course, this was for all episodes of symptomatic UTI. So this included uh, cystitis as well as more, uh, more severe episodes of UTIs such as pyonephritis. And if you look at the incidence of pyonephritis, it is there. Uh, it was around 16, 17% in both groups with absolutely no difference between groups um, in the year following asymptomatic bacteria. But again, uh, it is not because 16 or 17% of the patients develop pyonephritis in the year following asymptomatic bacteria that the episode of asymptomatic bacteria was related to the episode of pyrinephritis. And for instance, many patients had uh, a baseline episode of asymptomatic bacteria due to, let's say, E. coli, but at eight months later, um, an episode of pyrinephritis due to Klebsiella. So uh, it is not that simple and without, yeah. So I think that the, the risk is low. And this is also what we see with cystitis. If you don't treat acute cystitis, the risk of progressing from cystitis to pyonephritis in the general population is, is very low. Um, Robert's second question, which I'm not sure. Graft loss after pyelonephritis. 
uh, well, uh, I guess on the theoretical you know, point of view, if you don't do anything, so if you leave a patient with an uh, uh, invasive infection of the uh, kidney graft, and if you don't treat this patient with antibiotics, of course, the risk of having a progressing infection ending with, with severe damages, um, of course, this is this is this is real and important, but uh, you know it's clear that transplant physicians are very careful with episodes of UTI, and when patients present with even you know mild symptoms of UTI when they are becoming well, when there's a rise in the creatinine level, often they do a, um, a urine culture very rapidly, and so uh, we probably start antibiotics very early and. With that being done, the risk of graft rejection and graft loss is very, very low after uh, uh, pure nephritis. It's for sure far below 5% or even 1%. Yeah. Thanks, Joanne. Um, has anyone else on the, on, the, um, on the call have a question for Julian? Oh, I do have one actually. Um, what do you think, given the activity of um, cotrimoxazole in, in the urinary tract, um, what proportion of patients are on PJP prophylaxis? And do you well, think it, it has impact? It, it is highly variable between centres. Um, for instance, in the, in the, in the Burke trail, where we had 13 hospitals participating, we had hospitals stopping PJP prophylaxis after three, six months post-transplant. So systematically stopping pretty early. And we had one or two centers, um, especially one of the biggest um, uh, centers in France, where they just administer lifelong PJP prophylaxis. Uh, and of course, uh, patients that, so it is unclear whether, so it's, it's clear that PJP prophylaxis is very effective at preventing uh, PJP. Uh, it has been, shown in a meta-analysis of old studies performed in the 80s and 90s that it was also effective at preventing um, bacteria and bloodstream infections uh, after kidney transplantation. It's a bit less clear whether this is still true today now that we've got quite a lot of, um, of uh, cotrimoxazole resistance even in the general uh, population. Um, what I can say is that very often or almost systematically patients that are on PJP prophylaxis with Bactrim and that uh, truly you know, are compliant, that truly take uh, cotrimoxazole when they develop a UTI, have a cotrimoxazole resistant um, pathogen. Um, so it's clearly not a, a, a good therapeutic tool for patients that are already on prophylaxis. Thank you. And, and my one other question is, how translatable do you think are the, the results of this study to other countries where there might be extremely high prevalence of um, resistance and, um, for example, high pre mm. so for example, in India, how would, how would it go there? Uh, so the thing is that with, with Infections of the lower urinary tract, um, even with ESBLs and sometimes CPs, you still have kind of you know easy, effective oral options such as oral fosfomycin or um, nitrofurantoin. So uh, maybe the impact of resistance is more limited in this setting than it is with I don't know um, bloodstream infection or pneumonia. So um, the other thing is that when in the survey, when we, so we, we, we there was a couple of, of different uh, vignettes and, and clinical cases that we presented to the uh, survey participants. And it was interesting to see that people were easily treating with antibiotics um, uh, the episodes of asymptomatic bacteria, especially with quinolones, as you've seen, uh, when the organism was fully susceptible. But when we use a different clinical case with a participant having a very resistant um, 
uh, Club Celap, uh, that was uh, at least ESBR, I think we even said resistant to carb uh, in the urine. It was interesting to see that at the end, most of the trial participants uh, decided not to give antibiotics. Uh, that was interesting because as you know, the correlation between virulence and resistance is not clear and it is not because of uh, an isolate is resistant and very resistant that it is less or more virulent. So, yeah. Um, thanks. Catherine Bond, um, who is, you know, Catherine from... Yeah. Hey, Kate. <laughs> um, thanks, Julian. Very helpful study and great presentation. Care to comment on other situations where screening for asymptomatic asymptomatic bacteria occurs, e.g. pregnancy, and I'm going to stick in aged care here, um, a role for an RCT. Um, <clears throat> so the two indications that remain, as you probably know, are pregnant women and um, the patients that um, have a, urolog a urological intervention that is at risk of bleeding, so at risk of following the translocation of the colonizing bacteria from the urinary tract to the bloodstream. Uh, I think it is still, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, it was previously well accepted that pregnant women were a good indication um, for screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteria, yeah, and you may have seen the, uh, uh, the large cohort study from the Netherlands, if I remember well, published in the Lancet ID a couple of years ago with an embedded randomized control trial. And the conclusion of this big study was that uh, the risk of progressing from asymptomatic bacteria to uh, pure nephritis and the risk of uh, having harmful outcomes was in fact very limited, even if you don't treat. So um, there's now this debate of, of you know, of what are the benefits of using so many antibiotics in the pregnant population, and um, what are we really uh, avoiding, not only in terms of relative risk, relative risk between treating and not treating, but also in terms of absolute risk. So that's my point. And of course, for the urological patients that have a, an intervention, they are you know very good indications for screening for and treating, uh, even if it's sometimes a bit difficult to sterilize the um, um, the urinary tract in patients who have an abnormal anatomic um, uh, an abnormal anatomy of the urinary tract. Did I answer your question, Kate? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there, there are no more questions, but first of all, I'd like to say um, thank you. I think this is a really incredible body of work and absolutely practice changing. So now it's our job as stewards to help translate your findings into change of practice um, and disseminate and disseminate these findings widely um, to, for you. So um, congratulations and, and for those of us who are lucky enough to work with you, um, you you're a, a fantastic clinician researcher. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Kiast. It was a great pleasure to be with you all today. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And thanks, Arjun. And um, this presentation will be going up onto our um, webinar archive. And if you have had a chance, there have been some changes to the NCAS website, which is under continuous improvement. So hopefully um, we'd love some feedback about that as well. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thank you, Kaz. Thank you, Julian.